Hello, all. <clears throat> Just making a couple of quick announcements so everybody understands how the technology works and how the evening is going to go. We have two great panelists, Nate Tobik and David Waters from Oddball Stocks and OTC Adventure regular blogs. And then Ian Hunter, another really knowledgeable value investor who's going to be moderating this evening. The way it works is we'll have a conversation on the main stage that everybody can listen to. You can participate with Q&A on the right. Um, and then afterwards, we'll stop with some time left over to jump back into the roundtables and continue the conversations that are started on the main stage. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our guests. Brittany, I'm going to. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. You're good. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks Fred for having us here. Uh, so just to kind of, uh, set the stage here for, for this conversation, uh, you know, we're, we have the, the old value versus growth debate. And uh, just to kind of set the table for, you know, by, by way of background, um, you know, as everybody knows, value stocks uh, versus growth stocks, it's, it's been in the headlines a lot over, the, over many years recently. Uh, it, the gap between value and growth has, uh, has accelerated a bit in, just in 2020. So there's various ways that you can quantify the underperformance of value stocks, but um, one way is the Fama French Value Index, and that's been popular for for uh, many decades, and it's got its own flaws. But the the Fama French Value Index has underperformed the Fama French Growth Index by eight percent compounded per year. So it's it's returned 5%, and this is just over the last 10 years. It's returned 5%, and the growth index has returned 13% per year over the last 10 years. So th this debate's been clear for a while, but uh, you know, just another frame of reference for us, there's a, a recent publication by Verdad Capital, which is run by Dan Ras Rasmussen, and I thought it was pretty interesting. It basically says that if you look at the fan mag group of stocks, which are the large cap, uh, Microsoft, Netflix, Apple, Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook, and these are kind of a pro popular proxy for, for growth stocks. And they make up over 20% of, of the S&P. So these, these stocks are trading at a PE ratio of 55 times uh, earnings and a price to sales of seven times. But what Verdad Capital said was, let's just say, that's a reasonable price, um, given their level of profitability. Given their net their net profit is twenty six percent as a group. Um, their three year Kager revenue is twenty two percent per year, and they have you know near monopoly positions. So let's just say, for the sake of argument, that that's a reasonable price for that that set of companies. So for Dad asked, what is what about the other three thousand U S stocks that have a market cap? above $100 million um, that are priced more expensively than the fan mags, but they have worse profitability. And so they said, you know, what does that cohort look like? And the answer is there's 500 stocks out of those 3000 stocks that account for 7% of the S&P 500 and 25% of the Russell 2000. And so they call this the bubble 500. And those, those stocks trade at a median 13 times sales, and um, and the median company is not profitable, so they're they're operating almost break even. So you've got this situation where these companies out there that are even growthier than the fan mags, which is our big proxy for for growth companies, they're not even profitable, and this is a major share of the you know publicly traded companies. So um, you know just to bring it to a to a head, you know that gap is between value and growth is accelerating. And with rates this low, there's little hope of, 
of additional multiple expansion for these growth companies if you know if if it depends on rates dropping to achieve that so so the question is you know what do growth investors know that value investors don't so Nate and Dave what are your initial thoughts on this topic I, I so I'll start I mean I think what growth investors know that value investors uh, they know as well, but they've experienced on the downside is um, momentum and riding a wave. And, um, you know, while growth investors have rode a great wave into shore, we've been pushed under, you know, or swept out by the riptide. So um, that, I, that seems to be a significant factor when I, when I think about this. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fair statement to begin with. And and on one hand, we are dealing with uh, a set of businesses that are part of the public company cohort now that may truly be higher quality than they were a generation ago. There are a lot of businesses now that genuinely require little in the way of physical capital, have little constraint on growth in the short term, although the laws of competition will catch up with everyone eventually. But, and so I do think that value investors need to understand that just because a company appears to trade at a large multiple to, relative to current earnings doesn't automatically make it a, a bad value. Now, on the other hand, when you look at an index and every company or at least a sizable percentage of companies in that index are all trading as if they can grow almost without interruption for the next 15 or 20 years, then I think you can say we may have some issues of systematic overvaluation. And, and I think it is as typical. It's just investors, uh, excuse me if you're getting dings from my text messages. Uh, it's just investors assuming that current conditions will prevail from now till, till eternity. Uh, conditions have been wonderful for anyone in software and uh, well, Software is kind of eating the world, as they say. Conditions have been excellent there. But, but we know, looking at every industry in the course of humanity, that these conditions never last forever. Uh, I mean, a, a decade ago or a little longer, it seemed like commodities producers were set to enjoy 20 or 50 years of prosperity. And then, of course, that changed very rapidly. I remember that, yeah, the, the copper miners and the iron ore companies and the shippers associated with that industry were just had their day in the sun 15 years ago, and that came to a bad end. And so there's no doubt in my mind that there will be a reckoning when it comes to a lot of these uh, companies. And maybe it won't be in the Microsoft or the Apple or the truly dominant companies, but I do think there are a lot of pretenders uh, that are actually second-rate companies that are being valued as if they're game changers, as if they're set to dominate their industry. And only two or three of them can in any particular industry, but there might be 15 competitors all being priced as if they're set to dominate the world now. And so just like automobile makers in the 20s and 30s, just like aerospace had their reckoning, uh, software and associated industries will have its reckoning as well. So so Dave, to that, um, you know, and Ian, you're your little intro kind of reminded me of this. So uh, Scott McNeely, who was the, um, he was the CEO of Sun Microsystems back in the 90s. Uh, he was asked uh, what he felt about the value of his stock. And um, so for anyone who's unfamiliar, Sun Microsystems sold uh, computer servers and they were kind of the, um, you know, pick and shovel manufacturer that uh, everyone talks about in a gold rush. And um, you know they couldn't sell enough of these things to um, you know Wall Street and e-commerce and uh, literally anything. And I I don't know the exact number. It was 20, 30, 40 times sales. And he he broke down uh, in this interview. He said, you know, I would have to um, for the next we'll say it's 30 times sales for the next 30 years. I need to take all of my revenue and return it to investors. And I can't pay employees. We can't pay to build these machines. We can't do any of it. And then on the 31st year, they finally get a return from the business. Yeah. And he said, that's just absurd. It's so overvalued. And so, um, you know, anyone who kind of follows 
the history of Sun Microsystems, you know, they did fuel the dot com boom, um, and uh, and then they were sold to Oracle for pennies on the dollar. Uh, I don't know, six years ago, something like that. And um, now I think they exist as a, a brand logo that Oracle puts on some of their products for, you know, companies who bought equipment 25 years ago and who are just locked in and they can't upgrade. And so it's just this, this husk of its former self. And, uh, you know, investors who invested at that, if they would have held on, they wrote it down to nothing. And, um, you know, that's, that's one outcome right now. The interesting thing is a lot of the innovations they came out with other companies have taken that and ran with it. And so, um, it's not to say that what they did was, um, you know, worthless or anything like that. Uh, yes, they destroyed a, a lot of investor capital. And, um, at the same time, they actually did something that, you know, kind of the tagline changing the world and all this stuff, it, it, they did. Um, it's just that their investors were never able to benefit. So, so there's kind of echoes of what we think about today with these these uh, capital light tech companies that are platforms that are, you know, promised to to hold you know huge potential, and they do contribute to society and make it a lot better. And in some cases, you know, this is an example of one where that didn't that didn't happen. Right, uh, right, yeah. for sure. I mean, and one thing that's interesting, too, about that is, um, you know, within kind of the tech realm, uh, a lot. So there's an accelerator called Y Combinator that's really popular. It's on the West Coast. And, um, you know, I guess in theory, you go through this and, and you get a lot of mentoring and coaching. Uh, but the real secret, the real reason that Y Combinator is valuable is because they've had, I don't know, 500 or 800 companies that have come through there. And so if you come in with a company that sells a product to their other companies, these other companies will all start to buy your product right away. And now you have 300, 500 new clients right out of the gate. And, um, you know, so this ecosystem, a lot of it sells to itself. And so there is some factor of, um, you know, companies that will survive and thrive and grow. And then other ones who, are it's all just kind of that interlinked they're all selling to each other and um you know it's artificially inflated and if someone you know pulls the rug out on that bottom layer a lot of those those fall apart and um you know this isn't like i'm not down on tech i own a, a software company myself so um you know that's just the the reality uh, of kind of what that market is right yeah well you know, on the topic of these software and platform based business models that, you know, there is a case to be made that they're they're so capital light and they can scale rapidly and they have huge um, addressable markets. These types of business models do seem to be well uh, suited to this, you know, post COVID digital acceleration. Um, so that that's a, that's the case today, but that was also generally true a year ago, even before COVID. So how would you say this debate between value and growth stocks is being affected by the current situation we're in? This recession induced by COVID plus unprecedented stimulus, does the current environment provide any additional justification for the gap that we're seeing in value versus growth? I mean, I think that investors are were always will be fairly short-sighted in their assessment of company prospects on uh, economic cycles uh you know how long it took for valuations in certain industries to recover after the financial crisis even though the many of the issues had been resolved and i really do think that long after COVID is hopefully a, a memory the, the painful lessons that some investors got owning things like hotels or casinos or retail or, or food service or what uh, will stick in mind. And so maybe five or seven years from now, when that memory finally is far in the rear view mirror, that could, could be a good opportunity to get into some, uh, some shunned stuff. But 
and investors similarly um, love to forecast long into the future. I mean, the, the, the stock darling of the spring and early summer, of course, was Zoom, which probably most people here have used it in some capacity. And, and not to say Zoom isn't a, a good company. I mean, they, they make money. They obviously have a gigantic user base. They have issues, but every company does. At the same time, are we permanently in a world where the majority of our interaction with other people occurs over video? I'm not ready to say that's the case. And yet, in order for the valuation of Zoom or companies like it to make sense, you kind of have to assume that a large percentage of human interaction is permanently shifted to the virtual world. And I just don't think that's the case. I, I think that some people are like, you know, hey, virtual meetings actually do make sense. We Maybe I don't need to jump on that plane every single time I used to, or maybe I don't always have to be face-to-face. So a portion switches over, but I think investors are far too willing to assume that current conditions will, much like I said with software, will extend indefinitely. And so I don't think that the forces of mean reversion have been eliminated or can be eliminated. And so... But but I think that's what you see playing out a little bit in the in the disparity between between growth and value. I think it's really about investors looking at companies and saying there are good companies and there are bad companies. And every good company will always be a good company, and every bad company will always be a bad company. We know that's not the case. Uh, but all the same, investor perception can persist a very frustratingly long time, as as those of us who buy the unfashionable stocks a lot of the time are. It can tell you. But at the same time, when sentiment finally shifts, it can shift very rapidly. And so uh, it may not be to the point that the last true value investor has capitulated, but it, but it can shift and it, it can happen fast. So, so, Nate, you are, among other things, a specialist in the banking industry. So is it possible that part of the valuation gap that that we're seeing is explained by a perception that that these companies who are the, the growthiest companies, uh, they also happen to be larger than a lot of the, the value companies. And so are better, therefore, able to get financing than the typical component of the value stocks. Um, I would say no. And, and here's why. So um, if you walk into a bank and you say, um, look, I have some business and we're throwing off a million dollars a year in cash and I need to get, um, you know, half a million dollar credit line. Uh, that's a hard sell. And um, if you walk in and you say, I have a business that has this factory and we have all these people there doing things and it's on this plot of land you could drive by and um, we've been here for 60 years and we sell some boring things, uh, bankers will fall all over themselves to, to lock you up for um, a period of time because there's something there and um, there's something to lend against. And so kind of the, the, the biggest thing in lending is, you know, the banker always wants to get their money back. And, um, that's even more true now. So regulations have changed and there's the, these CECL requirements where uh, banks need to now adjust uh, their reserves at the time they make a loan for expected defaults, which um, is, I mean, it's totally crazy, right? Like if I was gonna loan you money and I expected you to default, well, then I wouldn't loan you the money. You know, that why, why would I do that? Um, but the reality is loans do default. And uh, so this is kind of like a, you know, pro cyclical type thing and that's the idea um so when you when you kind of look at this it's a bank sees something tangible and says i know i could get my money back or most of it back when you say i have this software product or um you know it, it could be a law firm a lot of things and we just we expect our revenue to to grow 50 percent a year forever uh it's just very hard to lend against that. And uh, there's some banks that do, uh, but it, that's not a traditional 
model to lend against, which is why most of these companies go to the equity market or they go to venture capital and they raise equity because, uh, you know, it's very uncertain to give a loan. And, and right now it seems like it's a great idea, uh, but it might not be. And so case in point to this, um, the SBA changed their lending standards. And so, um, you know, now with everything going on with COVID, what they've been saying is um, it, if your revenue accelerated because of COVID, so maybe you have an online product that everyone is buying and loves. Uh, now they're saying, well, we're not sure that's sustainable into the future once all this is gone. So we're, we're not going to be able to lend you money. And if your revenue took a dip, then now it's, well, you know, it used to be X and now it's Y and we're not sure if that's sustainable. So we can't really give you a loan until it normalizes. And um, when I think of the, those SBA standards and kind of that dynamic, um, that's the same as lending to uh, just giving someone a line of credit based on, on revenue or cash or nothing to secure it to. Uh, because you don't know, are the good times going to continue or, you know, it, there's nothing to anchor it to. And so, um, you know, if you look at most banks' balance sheets, almost all of what they do is secured lending. So it's commercial buildings, it's uh, residential buildings, it's lines, of, you know, blanket liens on lines of credit that is secured by everything that can't walk out at night. And uh, that's just the way the system is built. So, you know, that's the dynamic driving companies into the equity market for for financing. They, they don't have a way to... Uh, to be financed traditionally. So if we left out the growth stocks and just looked at the rest of the stocks that have more tangible assets, there, there still is probably within that cohort more of a, uh, a perceived financeability among the larger stocks, would you say? Yeah, it, you know, and, and the thing too is a lot of these larger, you know, so some of these um, larger companies, I mean, so look at like Apple, you know, that's a big tech stock. I mean, they manufacture devices and um, they have great products, but it, it isn't like, you know, it, it's not the, when people think software, they think a couple people who take the elevator home every day and there's no intellectual property or working out of a cafe in, in Thailand or something. I mean, Apple has, it's just a traditional business. And, um, you know, even like if you look at Facebook and Amazon and a lot of these, I mean, Amazon has an enormous logistics network and they have semis and planes. And, um, you know, you look at Amazon, they have all these data centers and all this real estate. So a lot of these capital like companies started, you know, they've all acquired real assets, so to speak. And that's very easy to finance traditionally. So I think back to what we were talking about earlier, what David mentioned was this second tier of companies that are um, overvalued, that are, are kind of the, I, what did you call them, Dave? I don't even remember, but pretenders, I guess. The, the pretenders, yeah. yeah. I, the, that's actually where the problem is, right? Because it's, they don't make any money and it's their fuel, they're financed by hype. And as long as they could keep the hype up, they could keep raising capital. Uh, but you cannot finance them traditionally because there's nothing to finance. At the same time, uh, you, investors need to remember the concept of uh, reflexivity. Uh, you can have a company, a bad company, but if it can tell its story and convince people that it's the next great thing and, and get its valuation at 20, 30 times sales, they can go out there and raise a billion or two billion in equity capital and maybe become a, a real company. I mean, maybe that was the mistake that Sun Microsystems made is when they were trading at 20 or 30 times sales, they should have issued another 30, 40 percent of shares outstanding and bought their way to. A, so I say watch out for that. A lot of people who have been really, really down on these companies for very good reason, because a lot of them are, are garbage. Well, they don't count on the fact that they essentially have access to endless capital as long as investors continue to believe in them. I mean, that was the thing with the dot-com bubble. The dot-com bubble stopped when investors stopped believing those companies and stopped being willing to finance them. But as long as these companies can continue to convince people that, that they're the future and they just need a few more quarters or a few more years, they can keep the doors open. And so that's, that's a warning for anyone considering going all in short on these companies or 
or, or being convinced that their competitors are just it's just another couple quarters so they flame out and the competitor rises well maybe not keep that in mind someone will shoot the moon successfully yeah for sure so so on the topic of interest rates you know we've got 10-year rates that are uh 75 basis points and 10-year treasury and uh, uh, the, the the tips are negative one percent so the market is basically expecting less than two percent inflation over the next decade um, a lot of us though believe there's a non-zero chance of seeing higher pr price inflation than we've had in the past decade due to the aggressive monetary and fiscal stimulus so how do you think about the prospect of higher inflation affecting value stocks versus growth stocks given the nature of the businesses that that comprise a lot of the growth stocks these tech companies and and uh is there a perception that the pricing power uh, could perhaps be a justification for some of this value valuation gap that we're seeing in the event of higher inflation? Yeah, I'd say a couple of points there. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, inflation has been low for a long time. Most investors and people seem to be just assuming that, you know, inflation will keep ticking along at one to two percent for a long time. and. The best time to buy uh, a hedge is always when that hedge is cheap. And so with people not expecting inflation, if you're concerned about inflation, it's probably not a bad time to buy a couple of assets that will do well in a, an environment of higher inflation. Uh, at the same time, I, I do think that, that long-term expectation of very low interest rates and low inflation rates does have something to do with uh, the disparity uh, that we're seeing between value and growth. Uh, it, growth stocks, of course, the majority of their cash flows, uh, if they materialize, are very far in the future. Uh, and when you discount those values back to today, at low rates, you get a, a high value. Um, with the 10-year uh, under 1%, if the 10-year goes to 3%, 4%, well, all of a sudden, those very long-duration securities with all those cash flows massively far out in the future become, well, they become worth a lot less. And uh, I'm not guaranteeing that investors will rediscover the magic uh, of, of value stocks or capital will flow back. Uh, nothing's a guarantee, but it, it does seem to make them relatively more attractive if we see a world in which higher interest rates prevail, but not a macro forecaster. So I, I cannot tell you uh, if what that may be. So Nate and Dave, you both tend to invest in, in off the radar, smaller, smaller cap stocks. And some analyses show that small and micro cap stocks have some of the lowest valuations within the, the value versus growth dichotomy. So what might be required for some of these small and micro cap stocks to start re-rating higher? People need to retire, give up, <laughs> die. I mean, it sounds awful, but that's, I mean, so some companies that um, I own and follow are at 15, 20 year lows and um, you know what? What to, maybe a lawsuit is what it's going to take in some of these to to unlock value, um, or the environment gets difficult, and um, you know the family who's run it forever they just throw in the towel and say, I, "I'm just not interested in running a business in a really difficult environment." It's getting a lot harder to um, you know to get that annuity stream of cash to keep flowing, and so. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's what it's going to take in a lot of them, unfortunately. Yeah, to, to that, I would add there's a general lack of interest in stock picking uh, in active strategies. And I understand why uh, indexes have done so well for so long that a lot of people think, well, what's the point in trying to pick stocks if I can just earn 15 to 20 percent annualized in the S&P or, or the NASDAQ index? and However, if, if that was interrupted for any reason, if we suddenly got into a three, five longer year period of unattractive or absolute negative returns in those indexes, I think we could see a return to people being a little bit more interested in active management and, and actually trying to identify uh, 
contractively priced securities where that exercise has honestly been a money loser for a lot of people for, for several years, but it's always cyclical. It really always is. Uh, I mean, I also, a lot of little companies, but some of the type that Nate was talking about where they really are radically cheap, especially versus the value of their assets. And, and some of those require a catalyst, the retirement of the, of the of CEO or a management buyout or an asset sale or something. Uh, at the same time, there, there are a lot of little companies that are just doing the right thing. They are investing well, they're making smart decisions, they're, they're growing, but they're not being crazy about it and not chasing after uh, buying the sky fantasies. And I will say it's rare that I see a company that successfully executes on an intelligent business plan for years on end and still remains absolutely cheap. It tends to be the companies that are a bit more scratched and have a bit more of an issue, whether it's a management issue or a business issue, whether they're experiencing some headwinds. Those are the ones that require something more of an external event uh, taking place, whether it's activism by shareholders or whether it's uh, changing industry conditions to make money. And so uh, I'd say if you're going to pick around in these little companies, which I think are wonderful, it's a lot of fun, there's an opportunity there, you're making a bet if you put either all of your capital into a basket of stocks that requires some sort of external catalyst, or you're also making a bet if you put all your capital in companies that don't have much in the way of capital assets or hidden assets but have uh, a business that's going well right now. I, I think it's best to sprinkle your bets around a little bit there and have a little bit of heat because you never know what future market conditions will, will be. It's, so, so one thing you hit on that um, is also the top Q and A item is the the active and passive, and I think that I think the flows into the passive strategies have just decimated a lot of these stocks because um, you know. So when I when I log into a brokerage account, it shows the top leaders, it shows the top funds, and uh, you you know when I talk to people who are not savvy at investing they log in and see that exact same thing and they say well these seem like good companies to to buy and you know a lot of cases they're they're the leaders in the the market um also the funds are the lead you know the s p fund and um you don't see it's very hard to build an index off of a lot of smaller smaller cap stocks just because of the dynamics in the market there's they have a low float there's just not many shares that trade and it's the index creator would never make any money on the product, right? So uh, you have to have a critical mass in the index fund to make any money on this thing. And so, uh, you know, the current trend is really buy passive stuff because I mean, why wouldn't you, right? If you just buy a passive index and it goes up one to 2% every day, I mean, you'd be crazy to look at anything else. And so a lot of the money is redirected into that. And, um, you know, the flip side is, uh, there's nothing in in the small cap. And I think there's actually a, another factor along these lines that people don't talk about, which is the, the popularity of a lot of the robo advisors. And um, so when I first started working out of college, you know, we got a 401k, and it was all these funds, and it was, you know, Fidelity and Putnam and, you know, American Century. And it went to active managers who were looking for um, deals or you know value or whatever, um, whatever they were doing, who knows. Uh, they were ripping your eyes out with fees when they did it. And um, that was awful. And so then you know the trend became, well, let's let's give our employees this product that has a couple basis point fee, which is the best. And you know they have all this research. And now that's what companies do. And, and one of the reasons they do it as well is because uh, that 401k committee that has to pick the funds, um, I was involved in one at one point, and uh, the executives were very scared to pick a new fund because um, what if it didn't perform well? What if employees did poorly in it? And so they would pick funds that had good five-year track records and they felt like an index fund gave them cover. 
So a lot of companies have shifted 401k money to these passive strategies. Uh, you have a lot of pension funds that are doing these passive strategies. And in all of that, there's a ton of money that is not looking actively at smaller stocks. And, um, you know, it, it's just, it's a popularity thing. If there's not many people chasing something, it's, it's going to be ignored. So I'll kind of wrap it up with, uh, with the last question here. Uh, so there, there's probably some various reasons to think that the future returns from today could be better in value stocks than in growth stocks. In addition to what we've talked about, U S 10 year treasuries dropped below 1% for the first time ever in March. And another interesting thing I saw from Verdad Capital, they looked at Japan, which is a place where they've had a zero interest rate policy for 20 years. And they said, you know, the, during that 20 year period, the large cap growth companies returned 0.8% per year and large cap value returned 4% compounded. Um, the small cap value did even better at 7% per year. So what they found was that these returns corresponded really well with where the assets were priced at the beginning of that period. So the free cash flow yield for the large cap growth stocks in 1999 was 1.6%, while for small cap value, it was 8.2% free cash flow yield. So their conclusion was basically that it shouldn't be a surprise that the entry multiple being paid on the cash flows was pretty predictive of which cohort performed better over the following 20 years. So my question is, as value investors, do you find it tempting sometimes, especially lately, to ignore where a stock is trading relative to its cash flow when we seem to be in a period where the best performers have barely any cash flow? I mean, so I'll say, uh, I think Japan's instructive. I don't have, I've been reading a book called The Bubble Economy. Um, it's downstairs. Anyways, it's, um, it was written right after the Japan uh, bubble crashed. And um, he talks about this a lot. And so it's written without knowing how history turned out, right? So it's very interesting to see. And, um, and he, you know, he he pulled that same sort of thing out in terms of the multiples people are paying it just seems crazy right and then um i i so you aren't stuck investing in the us you you don't have to you can invest anywhere in the world um a lot of european stocks are not at the same multiples as us stocks and uh japanese stocks are still cheap and you know the value thing has worked in japan um i I for I did some net nets there, and then I, they this at, you know the extreme value stuff didn't work as well as um, buying a company doing ten or fifteen percent on equity at uh, twenty to fifty percent of book value. That was that was the sweet spot, and those companies they would double, they would triple, and you have to sell it. You can't hold on. You're not holding on forever to this thing. It's um, and it was actually easier for me to do than a company in the US because I don't read Japanese. Uh, I was using Google Translate to try and pick these things. And so uh, anytime a, a company went up like that, it was a gift. You know, it's like, this is awesome. I can't believe it worked. I, I need to get out and, and move on. Where uh, I find in the US, a lot of times I overthink things because I'm familiar with it and it's I'm trying to read too much into it about what's going on or you know, about the personalities. And so um, it, the thing is this, it, it works, right? If you buy stuff that is extremely low valuations, eventually some person from across the ocean is gonna stumble on these things and start to buy them. And if one person's able to do it, you know, in, in however, you know, 7 billion people, it doesn't take that many people to say, wow, there's stuff at, at a 20% free cash flow yield or a 30% free cash flow yield. And, and then it becomes, it's a buy. And um, there was something I used to write about a lot, which was that, you know, value becomes a catalyst for itself, right? So at some point, uh, someone's going to say, wow, I have all this money invested in a company that will never make any money. And at the same time, my alternative is, here's some company that's paying a 12% dividend. 
every year and I get, I get 12% of my money back every, every year. And, um, and so, you know, you say, well, maybe 12 isn't enough. Well, what if that company then fell in half and now it's a 25% dividend and that sounds crazy, but Dave could attest, we have seen companies paying dividends like this that are just unheard of. And it doesn't take that many years of paying a dividend like that before people notice. And then, you know, from 25, now it's down to 12 and a half. And then now it's down to six. And it, you, it, it worked out really well as an investor. Yeah, well said by Nate. Uh, just a couple words for me. You mentioned about the free, uh, free cash flow yields in Japan at the time. Well, what is a free cash flow yield except a signal of market expectations? Uh, those small cap value stocks with the eight, nine percent free cash flow yield, well, the market's saying, well, they're not going to grow, or maybe they even shrink. Those large cap growth with a one point whatever free cash flow yield, the market's saying, oh, well, they have a decade of 20 plus percent growth. And that, of course, didn't happen for the large caps. And the small caps did much better than expected. So you do well as an investor when you have a view that is different than the market and you turn out to be right. And so if these large cap darlings of the day don't live up to the hype, and if the neglected, um, disfavored small cap value can simply do okay, well then investors will end up doing very well. The question is if that happens. And that's, so that's the question every investor has to figure out. Well, thank you guys. That's, and that's a good, you know, no, so right. just real quick and that the expectations is, um, you know, so when you look at what a, a stock is priced for, a lot of stocks are priced for perfection. And uh, a lot of small stocks are priced as if they're dead. And um, all it takes is one or two heartbeats. And, you know, it it's alive. <laughs> and And that's your return as an investor versus uh every single thing having to work out right and um you know i would say throughout history anything that has been predicated on being perfect uh, has has not worked um but there have been a lot of situations where you know you think it's uh you know a team is out of the running or whatever it is and then they surprise you and and that's that's all it takes really well put so Fred, uh, feel free to turn us back over to the, uh, the group setting. I wonder if Fred's mic's working. It, I, I, I don't know. Um, looking here at the Q and A. I mean, in the in the meantime, we could take a stab at. 